What is that? Uh, because you made, a, I think, a mistake in the email. It's your turn. You said on 17. Oh, the, the homework assignment? Yeah. Okay, so good afternoon, folks. If I have made a mistake on the due date for the homework assignment, the, the fifth homework assignment is due next week on Tuesday, which is the 7th. I don't know. Um, uh, I, I can go and fix it. Um, it's on the All right, great, great. So uh, we have our next homework assignment due on the 7th of April, which is this coming Tuesday. Uh, so um, any questions? All right, so we're going to continue our discussion on the input filter. Uh, so what we did last time was we considered a typical converter, like a DC-DC converter, for instance, the buck converter, which has a discontinuous input current. Uh, again, boost is not probably a good idea because it already has a continuous input current. And in order to kind of make the input current smooth, we added a second order filter on the input side to this converter, which is an inductor on the, the, uh, the series path of conduction of the current and a capacitor kind of in parallel. Then through simulation, we saw that uh, once we add this filter, the system goes unstable. So what we want to do today is uh, figure out why the system goes unstable and why is it that if we add a tiny little uh, resistor in series with that capacitor, it actually solves the problem. Now adding this resistor also has the advantage that any, any time you add a resistor to the system, you've got to be careful about uh, not actually exposing that resistor to a huge amount of current because otherwise you're going to lose some energy and over here, the current of the capacitor is not much, so adding a resistor does not really increase the, uh, the power losses in the system. It has a very minor impact. So what we did was we started with the classic uh, small signal model for the buck topology. Once there is no filter at all, now to make our notation simpler, I made an assumption that this resistor on the output side and this capacitor Together they form a inductance which is called Z1, and this inductor over here, uh, they, they form an impedance which is called Z1, and this inductor over here is another impedance which is called Z2. And then I added the low pass filter on the input side which is LF and CF, and then um, we are only caring about GVD, control to output transfer function, because this is the transfer function that appears in our loop gain. So we want to actually see what our loop gain looks like after we add this filter. Um, so because of that, I am assuming that the perturbations in the input voltage is basically zero. That's actually how you find uh, GVD. Only, you only perturb the duty cycle. So once I replace this, um, uh, source on the left hand side with a short circuit basically to make it zero I basically have LF placed in parallel with CF and that's why I call it ZF alright and then this current is actually in parallel with that, that impedance of ZF so going back to circuits one you can actually draw the the Thevenin equivalent model of a, instead of having a current source in parallel with an impedance, you can replace it with a voltage source placed in parallel with an impedance, which is this voltage uh, source over here, and uh, the value of, and by the way, because the current is going downwards, this current is going downwards, this polarity is actually reversed, so negative is on top, positive is in the bottom. Um, and the value would be, um, what we had earlier as our current source times the impedance of ZF. All right. So all I'm trying to do is kind of simplify this using my circuits one actually techniques and then in the end write the transfer function. Now what I can do is I can actually have a transformer in the middle of my model. I can transfer everything to the maybe right hand side doesn't matter right or left so on my notes I'm actually transferring in everything on the right hand side so let me do it <coughs> so a source of voltage transfers it be, it's being multiplied by the turns ratio which is D and then we have ZF transferred 
because it's an impedance, it's being multiplied by the square value of the turns ratio, and then the rest of the model. All right, so this is Z2. This whole thing is Z1. All right, so now I can actually further simplify this to a very simple source. Um, and by the way, this polarity still should be reversed. Yes. Or now I can combine these two sources with each other and write it like this, because they are actually in series in, with each other in the loop, which is the perturbations in the duty cycle times V out over R minus uh, V out over R times ZF times B. And then I have three pieces of impedance So this is the FD squared, this is Z2, and this is Z1, okay? And this is the output voltage. All right. So remember, ultimately, I was trying to look at the control to output transfer function. So I can actually write it to be like... <coughs> It should be R, I'm assuming, V out over, um, v out over R. This is V out over R or V out over D. Yeah. Okay, basically we have an impedance divider, very, very, very simple. Um, okay, so uh, what I can do is wait a minute, there is a V out over D and a V out over R. Somehow my notes are not consistent here. Let me, let me see if I can solve the problem. Um, this is V out over D, so this all should, should be V out over D. And this is also V out over D. Now, now, what's going to be funny is we cannot really V out over R, V out over D. The first part should be D. Huh? What is that? first part should be divided by D. We had times we... Uh, okay, so maybe that's where the problem... Is, is this also supposed to be D? You're saying this one's supposed no, no. to be? The, the third circuit. The third down. circuit, this one? Go down. Okay, hold on, let me clean this. This one. This one? one? The last one. The voltage source. All right. It, yeah. This one? Yep. Yeah. It should be R. And the other one should be D. The first term should be V by D. Uh, yeah. This should be D? Okay. Yeah, you're right. 
VR over D, this should be VR over R, okay. Okay, something like this, right? Okay, so, um, all right, so you can see the math could be a little bit confusing, but um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to kind of factor a bunch of parameters here out and rewrite this GVD in this form. Yes. Oh, I missed the first few minutes, so I couldn't understand the conversion between the first to second circuit. Could you All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna explain it again. Z F D S squared. Z one plus Z two. Okay. So what I did on the last line is I'm kind of factoring out the 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 terminologies or the part of the transfer function that I'm familiar with. As it turns out, this is nothing but our original GVD. Original, <coughs> which is when we don't even have an inf input filter. So this is basically what we had over here, okay, the original one. So you can see that once you add a, an input filter to your converter, it is as if you are kind of multiplying your original GBD by a new transfer function. And this new transfer function, which is this guy over here, is adding basically a bunch of extra zeros and poles to the system. And uh, for instance, uh, on the top, you can see that if you have a right half plane zero, and then maybe that is actually causing the instability in the system. All right, I'm about to continue this, but before that, let's go ahead and answer the question that I was asked. And that is, how did we get from this to this? Yeah, uh, I mean now. So the question is, once we start from here, which is the classic um, a small signal model for our Bach topology with an extra input filter, now remember, we are looking for GVD, so the perturbations in the input voltage is assumed to be zero, okay? So that means I'm replacing this source with a short circuit. So what remains is an inductor and a capacitor placed in parallel with each other. I call them ZF over here. And then that ZF is in parallel with the source of current, which is this guy. And then going back to circuit one, once you have a current source in parallel with an impedance, you can look, write the Thevenin equivalent model of that, which is a voltage source in series with the same impedance. So this is now the converted voltage source, and this is the same impedance. And then I transfer everything to the right-hand side. So we get the D squared term um, like uh, in the set of D squared? Once we transfer them. Okay. Yeah. So, once you transfer a source of voltage to the other side of a transformer, it will be multiplied by the turns ratio of the transformer. Once you transfer an impedance, it will be multiplied by the square value of the impedance. So that's what we are, by the square value of the turns ratio. So that's what we are doing here. All right. So let me, let me clean these. All right. Any other questions? Okay. So as you can see, uh, adding the filter, would be equivalent to uh, basically tr multiplying our original control to output transfer function with extra basically zeros and poles. Now, if we want our filter not to have a significant influence on the system, that means this part should be almost one. Ideally, it should be one. Okay, because if you multiply something by one, it doesn't really change the nature of that, that transfer function. So ideally, I want this, this to be one, meaning that, okay. All 
All right, let me write it here. All right, so if ZF, which is the impedance of my filter, times d squared over r, which is the load resistance, in terms of magnitude, it is very, very, very small compared to one, I can say, okay, this really doesn't matter compared to the one that is sitting next to it, okay? So in the denominator, I can also do the same thing and say, in terms of magnitude, <coughs> This should also be very, very small. So again, if this is very, very small, I can say this doesn't matter while it is sitting next to a 1, basically. So I have 1 on the numerator, 1 in the denominator. Then it is as if my original transfer function hasn't been disturbed much, OK? All right, so let's see what we can conclude from these two requirements. So this requirement is telling me that once I am designing the filter, I got to make sure my filter in terms of impedance is much smaller than the load resistance divided by d squared. And again, if you go back to the very small DC model for the system, r over d squared is the load resistance once it is transferred to the primary side. So that's easy to, to consider. And this one is telling us that the impedance of our filter should be much, much smaller than Z1 plus Z2 over D squared, which is the entire RLC circuit on the right-hand side of the buck converter now transferred to the primary side. So once you're designing this, uh, this filter, you've got to make sure that these two uh, inequalities are valid. If they are valid, therefore, you are not really disturbing your original transfer function. You are not adding very wide and weird, you know, up behaving as zeros and poles to the system. Um, and um, I don't really have a lot of math actually left here, but actually, as it turns out, once you add that resistor to the output filter, to the input filter, you are actually satisfying these requirements, okay? I don't really have the math for that, but take my word for that, that once you add, originally, once you add your filter, just an inductor and just a capacitor, those two inequalities in the end are not satisfied. But once you add this extra, actually, resistance over here, that inequality, those inequalities are satisfied. Therefore, your input filter is not disturbing the operation, the normal operation of your DC to DC converter. Uh, I'm not going to show you the simulation results because we saw it last time. I added a filter. It, was, it went actually unstable. Then I added the resistor, which is was like half an ohm, to the system, and it, it actually made the system stable. Okay. Now, remember this discussion was about adding a filter, but you can generalize it to if your source has an input impedance, something like that, or um, you have an upstream converter instead of a source. So the output impedance of that upstream converter also becomes into the picture, uh, plays, a, plays a role in the operation. So a lot of times when you have a converter, you would like to find out what is the input impedance of the converter, what is the output impedance of the converter, and make sure that, for instance, the output impedance of the upstream converter is much smaller than the input impedance of the downstream converter, something like that. Um, so there is some literature out there. Uh, one of my former students, actually, he published a conference paper looking at uh, classic DC-DC converters controlled via voltage mode control and current mode control, and he accurately found all these input and output impedances. So if you're interested, you can actually refer to that paper. And instead of doing the math on your own, you can actually find the transfer function and plug in your, your numbers. Um, any questions? Yes? So once we satisfy this thing, so will that be satisfied on how much input uh, voltage is filtered out? Oh, uh, no. Um, you mean how much input current is filtered out, right? No, these two, these are, these two requirements are for stability. Okay, now, 
So the question is, once we satisfy these two equations, is our input current very well regulated? The answer is no, uh, or maybe yes. It depends on how you have picked your numbers. Um, when I was an undergraduate student, we had a course which was called filters. It was a three carried out course. It would actually, you would learn how to design a filter, where to place the zeros and poles. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that course here in the curriculum. But remember, you are designing a filter to eliminate a particular harmonic, right? So, uh, so for instance, if you look at the harmonic content of the input of the switch current, you have a DC harmonic, all right? Then you have something at the switching frequency. Then you have something at twice the switching frequency, and so on and so forth, right? But you can do a Fourier analysis to see all the harmonic content of your input current. Now, your filter should be designed in a way that it passes through the DC harmonic and attenuates the higher harmonics, OK? Ideally, if you eliminate all the higher harmonics, your, uh, your input current over here is basically an absolute DC signal, which is ideally what you want. So uh, you're looking at, most of the times, obviously, if the order of the filter is higher and higher and higher, you're doing a better job in terms of eliminating the harmonics. But at the same time, your filter is getting larger and more complicated and may, maybe actually more stability problems. So in this case, I'm using a second order system. So what you can do is this corner frequency over here, which is 1 over the square root of LC, should be, um, I don't know, 10 times smaller than the switching frequency, something like that. So that is the only, that's the simplest way of telling you what the L and C values should be. Um, all right. Now, this resistance is going to be determined by those requirements in the, in the bottom, basically. Usually, half an ohm is enough, basically. All right, any questions, other questions? So this was just a kind of a little bit of a discussion about uh, stability in converters. Converters, power electronic converters, are not very easy in terms of cascading them with each other. If you are simulating something, you realize things are crazy, got crazy, it could be a stability thing that you can actually look at the, a small signal model and kind of predict the behavior of the system. All right, um, there are no questions. I'm going to move on to the next topic, actually a different topic, which is multi-level power electronic converters. So this is kind of like a new chapter. Yes. Uh, would we be performing some simulations? I mean, building up some circuits in, in the coming homeworks? Like um, in the past, we had homework assignments to. Um, make some models and design some controllers. But my challenge as the, as the person who was grading the homework assignment, I couldn't tell if this is the original work of the student or the friend of the student, basically, because you just easily copy and paste someone else's model and put your name on it. So I'm ten trying not to actually assign you those kind of homework assignments. If you guys are interested, uh, I can give you the homework assignment, and you voluntarily do it for yourself, for your own, basically, educational purposes. So uh, yes, in the past, we had them. But then the, the debate was, is this the original work, or someone else did it, and copy, everybody else copied it from him or her, something like that. But yeah, I have samples. If you are interested, I can share those with you. OK, uh, so moving on, we are kind of moving out of this small signal analysis and then going into to more like a topological studies of uh, more uh, new types of power <coughs> converters, which is multi-level power electronic converters. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, multi-level converters were not around, primarily because uh, the switches were not reliable. And at the same time, um, the domain uh, that power electronic application existed were not in the high voltage applications. Now we are expecting more and more from power electronic converters. For instance, we expect our power electronic converter to be interacting with the power grid at the distribution level. So we are looking at, for instance, 10,000 volts, 20,000 volts, or 20, or I don't know, 30,000 volts. 
So we're looking at converters that can handle several thousand volts. Now, the challenge in those applications are, of, is actually the voltage is too high, and one particular switch cannot handle that huge or large amount of voltage. So you, for instance, if your application is 10,000 volts, you cannot find, easily find an, a MOSFET or an IGBT that can handle 10,000 volts. So this is why the concept of multi-level power converters came along to address this need that we have switches that are because of the, for instance, price limitations and cost limitations or even reliability limitations, they have lower voltage ratings, but you want to manipulate them so that your overall voltage rating is actually higher than one particular switch. So uh, there are some advantages. I'm going to explain the advantages now, but since you haven't seen the basically converters, you don't really know what I'm talking about unless actually we see a bunch of these converters. So um, let me just have a little bit of a table over here. So if you look at power applications for power electronic converters, we have low power applications and then we have high power applications. So low power applications, like you have an electric motor of several kilowatts, you want to drive that electric motor. Or high power applications are, for instance, you're dealing with some sort of a large battery energy storage system, like a multi-megawatt uh, kind of a system. Uh, for high power applications, historically, we use SCR. Okay. Um, they are very high current devices. You can turn them on, but you cannot turn them off. They have to decide their own turn off procedure. For low power applications, uh, we use MOSFETs and IGBTs. All right. Um, for medium power, which sits in between, we don't really have a good switch to actually do that. So technically, we got nothing. We cannot extend the voltage rating or current rating of existing IGBTs to what they are, 10 times more than what they are. And we cannot actually enjoy SCRs because SCRs have a lot of limitations in terms of switching frequency, for instance. So multi-level converters are trying to address this segment. So naturally, we don't have switches available in the market or technology, semiconductor technology, that could address this need. But then we try to use multi-level converters. And in multi-level converters, we use MOSFETs and IGBTs. All right. So some of the advantages of multi-level converters are advantages. One of them is um, low harmonic distortion. I'm going to show you a bunch of waveforms that you are going to be convinced that they have a better harmonic distortion. And by nature, when you talk about low harmonic distortion, that means your power factor is better, okay? High power factor. Okay. 
okay? The other one is less voltage stress. On switches. And we're gonna see what that is. And the other one is modular structure. Okay, so you can argue that since they are modular, you can, for instance, reduce cost or something like that. All right, the other application, the other advantage is reduced, since voltages are lower, you can also argue that Reduce dV over dt, uh, variations of the voltage while the switch is turning on or off. And this could actually potentially map into reduced switching losses or fault triggering of the devices or less stress on the devices anyway. All right. We have three major categories of multilevel converters. And I'm going to explain. So we have three major categories. We're going to start with the cascaded H bridge converter. Okay. Or maybe, okay, yeah, let's just start here, cascaded. Okay. So, um, first of all, what is an H bridge? Okay, so if you have a source of voltage, let's say a battery for instance, and um, let's call it VDC, and in parallel with that source, you place two single pole double through switches, you have constructed basically an each bridge. So you can argue that your V out could be so depending on the position of these two switches, if they are both connected to the top throw, they are kind of shorting the output, so it's actually giving you zero. If they are both connected to the bottom throw, again, they are giving you zero. Uh, but if, it's, if the, this one is connected to the top, this one is connected to the bottom, uh, V out is VDC. And... If the one on the left is connected to the bottom and the one on the right is connected to the top, you're looking at negative VDC. Okay? So by selecting the position of these switches, you can either have basically three levels of voltage apply three levels of voltage to your output, which is either positive VDC or zero or negative VDC. So, for instance, if your objective is to generate a sinusoidal signal, you can generate it this way. Okay, so your output voltage is not sinusoidal, but it is AC, and you can argue that it has a fundamental harmonic, which is sinusoidal, obviously. Oops. All right. And... Uh, 
then for instance you're trying to send energy to the grid or you're trying to provide some AC power to an electric motor there could be a low pass filter in between the source or your H bridge and your load which is the grid or the electric motor or the grid and the electric motor could be behaving as a low pass filter by themselves so um, even though you are sending your load a square shaped kind of a waveform you can argue that the effect of uh, it would actually see the my load is going to see some sort of an AC signal, almost a sinusoidal signal. So uh, this is a single H bridge. Now, in some papers, you may actually see that this H bridge is being drawn this way. They are exactly identical, only drawn differently. So this is the output voltage. And this is the DC source. So the second one in the bottom is easier to envision if the throws are on the top or in the bottom. It's like you're kind of shorting your output voltage, so your output voltage is basically zero. All right. Now, um, in terms of switch realization, it depends on uh, this current. So we don't know, most of the time these are you know, AC signals, so if your output voltage is AC, you would expect your output current to be AC as well. So this current is sometimes positive and sometimes negative. So when it comes to switch realization, you're looking at a positive throw voltage, but a dual polarity current, so you're looking at the right half plane switch realization. Alright, so this is basically, I didn't draw the other, the other throw, but they're exactly the same. So you have two switches and two diodes for each basically leg, and since you have two legs, in total you need four switches and four diodes that can handle uh, basically a positive DC voltage, but a bidirectional electric current. All right, there's a third way of plotting this thing, which would be, which actually resembles an H. That's why it's called an H bridge. And this is how some people draw it. All right. So these three, on, on the left I have three topologies. They are basically the same topology. Depends on what paper or book you are looking at. Just remember, um, over here, these two switches are not complementary switches, okay? These two are complementary switches. And these two as well. So the ones that I've drawn a, like a contour around are complementary switches, meaning that they are forming a single pole double throw switch, meaning that at any given time one of them is on, the other one is off basically. And also let me write over here, we can generate three levels. So this is all about just a single H bridge. So in order to create multi-levels, we can generate a minimum or a maximum of basically three levels, positive VDC, negative VDC, and zero. But in order to go to more number of levels, you've got to put a bunch of these H bridges 
in series with each other. Okay, as simple as that is. So let me put them in series and then we can discuss it. So this is one H bridge that I have, and then I place it in series with another H bridge. Okay, so now for instance, this is V out one. And from here to here is V out two. And the total output voltage is V out. Okay. All right, as you can see, we have two H bridges. Therefore, we need H switches and H diodes to realize this. Or H transistors and H diodes. Let me write transistors. We also need two sources, two independent sources of VDC1 and VDC2. And also note that uh, depending on where you assume the ground of the system is, the two sources do not have identical grounds. Meaning that if I assume that this is the ground of my system, then I cannot assume that this is also the ground of the system. Okay? So remember that. So that means you're kind of, you can argue that your sources are kind of floating, okay? Something like this. One transistor phase, the whole system fails. Yes and no. If one, uh, we, can, uh, we can discuss this, if one transistor phase, for instance, let's say this transistor over here phase. Well, you still have the le left-hand side H bridge active and on the right hand side you can still bypass it through putting this in the bottom situation position and putting this in the bottom situation so you're kind of bypassing the second H bridge so it's called a limping mode you are still generating some sort of an AC but it is not as good as what you want it to be so yes in terms of reliability you can argue that there are too many switches in the system that the system can f actually survive in case of a failure of one of the particular components in the system all right, so uh, let's look at this. Uh, let's see, what, well, let's see what, what I mean by a multi-level output voltage. So if you look at V out 1, which is the output of my first H bridge, it could either be, depending on the position of the switches, VDC1, it could be 0 or negative VDC1. If I look at V out 2, again, depending on the position of my single pole double throw switches, it could be positive VDC2, it could be 0, or it could be negative VDC2. Okay, so I have three possibilities on the left, I have three possibilities on the right. On the right. Um, in total, once I add these together, I have basically nine possibilities, okay?
I can have VDC1 plus VDC2. I can have VD minus VDC1 minus VDC2. I can have plus VDC1 or minus VDC1. Um, I can have the difference between VDC1 and VDC2. Then I can bypass the first H bridge and just generate plus or minus VDC2, which is two other states. And I can bypass both of them and get basically zero. So I have a total of nine levels. All right. So now, remember, only having one H bridge, I had three levels which I was able to generate an AC signal. One positive level, one negative level, and a zero level. Now that I have nine, I can actually generate a better output voltage in case my objective is to generate an AC signal. So let's see. One, two, three, four. Okay. So technically, if I select these, you know, uh, these levels correctly correctly or an intelligent way I can have up to a maximum of nine levels and if you I do a particular for instance a staircase modulation scheme I can generate an output voltage which looks like this and if once you do Fourier analysis you can realize that this output voltage in terms of total harmonic distortion is much better than my previous output voltage okay I only had three levels initially and uh, your total harmonic distortion is somewhere around, I don't know, 100 and some percent. Here, because you have better resolution in selecting your voltages, you can generate an output voltage which has a better uh, uh, THD, basically. So compared to this guy, if I call this high THD, this one has a lower THD. And in case I'm not still happy with my THD, I can increase the number of H bridges. You can actually add a third H bridge. And then over there, you have three times three times three, 27 different levels. So you have actually have a very, very fine, you know, resolution in your output voltage and having a very low THD, basically. Um, so the positive thing is you can actually improve the total harmonic distortion in your output voltage. The negative thing is complexity of the system is increasing. Initially, you only had four switches and four transistors and four diodes. Now you are actually doubling that, eight transistors and eight diodes. Also, the conduction losses is going to increase now what and uh, as well as switching losses for instance let's say you want to have an output voltage of uh, for instance uh, VDC1 plus VDC2 so you open you close this switch then you close this one so this gives you VDC1 then you close this one and then you close this one so this gives you VDC1 plus VDC2 but you can see on the conduction path of the, the current, the current has to flow four different switches. Each switch is representing some sort of a conduction loss. So overall, your conduction loss is at least twice as much as the case before, where the electric current has to only flow through two, basically, switches. All right. Any questions so far? Yes? Uh, in the case when the output is VDC1 plus VDC2, mm -hmm. uh, the voltage stresses on the 
other bits uh, switches would be more, right? Oh, so excellent question. So let's talk about voltage stress. Um, so remember when I was, I was when I was talking about. So probably we have made a point over here that if I use a multi-level converter, my total harmonic distortion is better. Okay. Let's look at the other point that I made. Uh, you know, mentioned earlier, which is low voltage stress. Right. Let's look at over here. So please remember, in terms of voltage stress. Let me let me pick green or some other color. Okay. So the vo see all of these single pole double throw switches have two transistors and two diodes. So like this very top one, the voltage stress is VDC1. And the bottom one is also VDC1. Okay, let me see if I can make it a little bit thinner. Yeah, here is the same. Here is VDC two. Okay, so the voltage stress in one H bridge is independent of the voltage stress in the other H bridges. So, for instance, potentially you can generate, let's say you have VDC1 to be, for instance, 200 volts and VDC2 to be 300 volts. So, potentially you can generate 500 volts in your output, but the voltage stress on your components on the left, we have 200 volts. On the right, you have 300 volts. So that's the other advantage of the multi-level converters. Yes? That's only true if you never go from fully on to fully off. Um, it's true all the time. It doesn't matter what your switching sequence is. Remember, whatever I do with these switches, at any given time, one of them is on, the other one is off. Okay. So for instance, uh, let me draw it over here maybe. So let's say, let me just, uh, let me draw them with like a regular switches. Mm, hold on. Okay. All right, something like this, for instance, okay? This is just one of the edge bridges. So it doesn't matter what you do. For instance, for this switch, because the other one is on, this is VDC1. And it doesn't matter what the next state is. In the next state, are you still going to keep the top switch on and the bottom switch off, or you're going to change the, the polarity between them? In that case, this is going to be VDC1, and this is going to be basically 0. So it doesn't matter from what switching state you're jumping to the other one. At any given time, your switches need either see 0, that means they are on and conducting, or when they are off, they see the, the associated voltage source, which is VDC1 or VDC2. All right. So this is the major advantage of these converters which is, for instance, if you are using 600 volt IGBTs, potentially you can go as uh, an output voltage which is as high as, ideally, 1,200 volts, which is 600 plus 600, something like this. All right, any other questions? OK. So, um, so as I said, one of the disadvantages of these topologies is that you, for this particular case, you need two independent sources of voltage, okay? And not only just two independent, they should be floated, you know, it's not like you have a, a string of batteries like this. Let's say you have two battery banks, and you say, okay, I have two battery banks selected, uh, you know, connected in series with each other, and I can 
for me to be a, a, an H-bridge topology, a cascaded H-bridge. No, you cannot unless you have, actually you can break, break this point and basically they shouldn't be in series with each other anymore. Although there are techniques and there are papers out there which are talking about uh, you can actually use the one of the H bridges to be a, a source and the other H bridges to have a capacitor or a large capacitor instead of a source. And then you have an extra requirement which is the regulating the voltage of that capacitor at a desired level. So there are also papers out there. Uh, but let's talk about a general case and then some specific cases. So in general, If we have n cells, like here we have two cells, maybe later you have three cells, you can have three to the power of n levels. Okay, so here I had uh, two cells, so I can generate up to nine levels. Okay. Now, what if all of your voltages are identical in terms of voltage values? Then you only have two n plus one levels. Okay. And what if, like, they are ordered in a, in a sense that you have a small one and the next one is twice as much as the small one and the third one is tw three times as much as the small, or four times as much as the small one. So we are looking at VDC1 is two times VDC2, then VDC2 is two times VDC3 or four. So like for instance, we have 100 volt source and 200 volt source and 400 source, volt source and 800 volt source. Uh, so this is going to give you 2 to the power of n plus 1 minus 1 levels. Okay. So what happens to the other levels? Basically, we are going to have some redundant levels once, once there is a relationship or a proportionality between VDC1 and VDC2, like if they are identical or one of them is twice as much as the other, you're going to see there is going to be some, uh, some redundancy. For instance, let's take a look at that. For the example that I had above, that I only had two H bridges, if VDC1 is the same as VDC2, then V out would be negative 2 VDC 2, negative VDC 2, or negative VDC 2, or 0, or VDC 2, or twice VDC 2. So all of a sudden, instead of having nine levels, I'm down to five levels because, so if you look at the original number of levels, you can see, uh, for instance, let's say VDC1 and VDC2 are both 100, okay? Then in that case, this, which is the difference between the voltages, gives you zero, and you already had a zero state already. So this kind of eliminates two levels out of your hands. The other one is positive and negative 100, positive and negative 100. So they're, again, identical. So again, this reduces and adds to the redundancy in the system. Now, looking at the second case, if VDC1 is twice as VDC2, then the output voltage could be, so this is only five levels. V 
with four other levels that are redundant. And if VDC1 is twice as much as VDC2, then Vout is going to be seven levels. All right, something like this. Only seven levels. With two other stages that are redundant. And in those papers that I mentioned that actually we don't have, uh, like if you have two edge bridges, we don't have two sources. We only have one source and one capacitor. We are using those redundant stages to charge or discharge the capacitor of the second edge bridge. All right. Any questions? All right. So this was all about, yes? For the last case. OK. It should be eight. What? Oh, in terms of number of levels? Yes. So we have two here, two here, two here, and one here. Two so. n plus one. Like two five. n plus, oh, wait a minute. Hold on. So that is 2 to the power, yeah, that's 2 to the power of 3 minus 1, which is 7. N is 2. You mean, you mean for this last case? All right, let me check the math. No, it's right. Is it right? Yeah. Okay. For here, N is equal to 2, so we have 2 times 2 plus 1, which is 5. For uh, the last case, we have N equal to 2, which is 2 to the power of 2 plus 2, which is 8 minus 1, 7. Okay. All right, other questions? So this was our first category of multi-level power electronic <coughs> converters. Let's look at the second category. So this was category one. Let's look at the second category. The second category is called diode clamped multi-level converters. Okay. Now, consider a case like this. <clears throat> Let's say you have two sources of voltage. They are placed in series with each other. And then somehow, magically, you have a single pole the ripple stroke switch. Okay, and you define this as your output voltage. All right. So you have a single pole. Three, uh, triple throw switch. Okay. So we're going to talk about where we can get this switch because we haven't seen any anyone yet this, in this class. But anyway, assuming that we have one. Uh, my output voltage could be, let me label this to be VDC1, and then this would be VDC2. So depending on the position of this basically pole, which, which throw is actually engaged, if the top throw is engaged, V out is VDC1 plus VDC2. <coughs> Mm -hmm. 
If the middle one is engaged, V out is VDC1. If the bottom one is engaged, it's zero. So we managed to make basically three levels. All right. Previously, as far as this class has been concerned, we were only using single pole double throw switches. So we could only generate two levels. Now, if magically we find a single pole three pole throw switch, we can generate three levels. And then we can actually increase the number of throws and actually add more to the number of our levels. All right. So the question is, how are we going to be able to build this single pole triple throw switch using the you know semiconductor devices that we have seen so far all right so let's take a look at this all right so i want to find a switch realization for the sky and i am already familiar with single pole double throw switches so i'm trying to build this guy using single pole double throw switches using three of them actually all right something like this Okay, so depending on the, on the position of the switches, I can argue that, for instance, if this is engaged and this is engaged, it would be equivalent to the top one being engaged, okay? So that's one possibility. If this is engaged and this is engaged, it would be equivalent to the middle one being engaged. And there is another redundant state for this, and that is when this is engaged and this is engaged. Again, that would be equivalent to the middle throw being engaged. And if this one is engaged and this one engaged, it would be equivalent to the bottom throw being engaged. All right, so yeah, we can actually do this. And now, single pole double throw switches, we are familiar with them. We know how to realize them and how to work with them. Now, in terms, of in terms of switch realization, a lot of times our voltages are positive, but our currents are bidirectional. So this current that ultimately goes out could be positive, could be negative. That <coughs> means this current could be positive or negative, and therefore this current could be positive or negative. So again, when it comes to uh, switch realization, we are looking at the right half plane, basically, switch realization. Voltage positive, current bidirectional. All right. So now let me do a switch realization here. So the system is going to look like this. That's on the right is our actually pole. And by the way, I tend not to draw the gate of these transistors, but they all have gates, obviously. Okay. 
Now, as it turns out, uh, there is a way of actually getting, uh, there are, there is some redundant states, redundant states over here, we can actually eliminate one of the switches. As it turns out, we don't really need this switch, and we don't really need this switch. Okay, now why is that? Um, So, um, for instance, assume that you have a positive current on the output side, and you want the middle throw to be engaged. You don't, basically, you've got to do nothing. That current is going to push this diode to turn on. Oh, actually, you've got to turn this transistor on and the current flows out, all right? And in case that electric current is negative, what you can do is, you have, you have two options for a negative current. So if the current is negative, the current comes here. Oops, what did I do? Okay, the, I don't know why we have two of these here. In case the current is negative, you can argue that I can direct the current this way. Do nothing here, therefore it pushes the diode to turn on, and then turn this transistor on and the current goes out. Okay, that means I really need that top transistor. However, you can do it another way that you don't really need that top transistor, and that is uh, like this. Let me pick another color. You can turn this transistor on, and this diode, and then current goes out. So since there are two possibilities to have the middle throw engaged, and at the same time having a negative current flowing into the pole, you can argue that I can, I can, I'll choose the green path over the blue path and therefore I don't really need the blue path and then the transistor that was associated with the blue path so I can eliminate this transistor. You can make a similar argument with, let me do, let me redraw this. Uh, redrawing this takes forever, let me do it again really quick. So we just argued that we don't really need this guy at all. What about the bottom one? So I'm going to make an argument about why we don't need this transistor that I just drew. So presume that the middle throw is supposed to be engaged and the pole voltage is, a pole current is positive. So it can force the diode to turn on. You turn this transistor on and it goes out. No problem. The other alternative that we don't use would be turn this transistor on and it goes out again. So we have, again, two equivalent states. In both the states, the output current or the pole current is positive, and at the same time, the middle throw is engaged. And you would say, I would choose the red path so that I wouldn't need this transistor. So actually, I can delete this transistor, OK? So as it turns out, instead of having six transistors and six diodes, we only need four transistors and six diodes. So let me draw the final diagram. Oops, actually we don't have time for me to draw the final diagram. I'm going to start it from uh, the final dry diagram over here and then we are going to move uh, with, in case we have a quadruple throws kind of a switch. Okay. So don't forget about your homework assignment for, for Tuesday. Uh,